So first one here, this is from Stephen Parker, and Stephen is a longtime member of OrlandoDrummer.com, and in the forums there, he asked this. He said, hey Adam, I've heard you list your favorite slash most influential drummers before, but I'd love to hear you elaborate on why you specifically enjoy their playing. I know Chris Coleman and Benny Greb should be on this list. All the best and loving the sight. Well, thank you, Stephen, and you're right. I would definitely put Chris Coleman and Benny Greb on that list for sure. I would have to add, I'll add two more just so we don't spend too much time on this question because I could probably do a very long rant uh, depending on how long this list of drummers is. Uh, I'll add Yost Nickel and Dave Dicenzo. I would put them up there. So let me just give you some some thinking points on each one of those specific drummers. So the most obvious one here is going to be Benny Greb. Um, touch, groove, feel, just all of those intangible, very difficult to quantify elements of his playing. Those are the things that I love the most. And he's also a cool one because I have met Benny many times. Um, I've, I've had a lesson with him before and I helped him with some video projects a few years ago. So we had many Skype calls and things. And, you know, you always hear that that phrase, you know, it's something in the ballpark of don't meet your heroes because they'll disappoint you sort of thing. Like you have this this image in your head of how a person should behave or what their demeanor might be like. And then you meet them and then you're sort of disappointed because they don't live up to that necessarily. That's not true with Benny. He is cooler than you might imagine, right? He's very down to earth, very relatable um, and a shockingly healthy ego for someone who is as famous, talented, um, and as accomplished as he is. Now, what I love specifically about his playing would be, honestly, like his choices, like his his taste, right? Because it's, it's, you know, it's not technical ability with him. You know, Chris Coleman will be the next guy that we talk about. And with Chris Coleman, it's definitely a technical ability thing. With Benny, it's much more that he could play something that you could learn. You can play a lot of the things that he plays. It's the delivery. It is how he played it. And if you wanted to go to the next level of, of analysis, it would be why he played it, right? Um, it, sort of understanding what what some of those choices are and why he makes them that that's what it would be like to to get inside the mind of many greb and it's a very interesting landscape in there so uh for me it's his taste his choices his preferences um and, and some of those musical directions that, that he tends to go and how they're all flavored and textured with this again intangible touch feel and groove that we all uh, know that he has I, I just love using him as an example of someone who he can play a basic rock beat, just like you and I can, but if you want it to sound how it sounds when he plays it, that's going to take about 20 years, right? It's it's such a, a particularly dialed in uh, touch, feel, and groove. So that's why Benny uh, has always been on my list. Uh, next, we'll do Chris Coleman. Man, for Chris Coleman, it, technical ability, first of all, just the amount of hours the guy has put in on the kit to have uh, the amount of, of concepts down that he has right to be able to execute these high level rhythmic concepts on the kit flawlessly too like and he's to a level too where where certain players have this quality it's like they cannot make a mistake because they are so free within the rhythmic scale that even the mistakes can lead them into another direction where they can just sort of work things out it's like someone who's so good at speaking or, or so good with linguistics that even when they say the wrong word, they can change the sentence in the middle and the sentence still made sense. It's kind of like that. So uh, his execution of everything he plays is just absolutely flawless. Obviously, he has deadly speed. I mean, it doesn't get too much faster than Chris Coleman. Um, and also a weird one with him that you don't hear a lot of people talk about, but but control, like control over his over his output. Because for what he is able to play, Let's call that his sixth gear. That's his top gear, like on the highway when he cracks 120 miles an hour and past that. He can go there whenever he wants, but he doesn't, right? It's very, it's not even in like every Chris Coleman video. If you were to line up all the famous YouTube videos of Chris Coleman, whether it's a minor performance or a drum festival or anything like that, only like one in five of them will you see him sort of hit that sixth gear of his playing. And to me, that's a that's a genuinely like a that's just a musical maturity thing. Right. Because I know in all of the different performance videos that I've done over the years, you know, there's many of them where I make my best attempt to play towards that upper end of my skill level because you know, let's be honest, it's likely related to ego where you want to showcase your skills and you want to showcase the best skills that you have at the highest level that you can manage to pull off. 
And it's so fascinating when you see a guy like Chris Coleman who has that sixth gear and just, you know, it, it's hit or miss as to whether or not he's actually going to go into it. So to me, that shows a, a lot of musical maturity, a real balanced ego in his playing as well. Um, but ultimately, you know, my attraction to his playing is rooted in technical ability. Just absurdly good at everything, right? Uh, next up, I would go Dave Desenzo. And man, if you're not familiar with Dave Desenzo, because he's, I, I, I wouldn't say he's underrated. Everybody that knows who he is knows that he is uh, an absolute world class player. Um, but I would say there's a video, I'll put it on the screen, but I think it's called Two Tone Shoes, something shoes. Anyway, I'll put it on the screen or link it in the description, but it's a video of him playing back in the 90s. And oh my goodness, it, I'll steal a phrase from my buddy Austin Bertram, who described that video. Uh, Austin said, it is one of the best technical displays of advanced drumming in the world. He covers so many different skill sets, from double bass to a wide variety of patterns and rudiments on his hands, insane speed, mobility, fluidity. It's just, it, it truly is. It's one of the best displays of advanced drumming you could ever watch. If you were talking to, let's just say, a friend who was not a musician or not a drummer at least, and they said, show me some absolutely sick drumming, like some of the best in the world, this is the video that you would pull up as that example. So uh, what I personally love about Dave DeCenzo's playing is is honestly how emotional it is his use of some of the some of the tools that we have in our tool belts as drummers so that would be like and not just drummers either like just artistic expression in general you would have these same tools if you were a painter right like um tension and release like all of these like storytelling elements um the the ability to build up dynamically and then let all of that go just to create different emotional responses in your listener or in your viewer you know through the use of these tools man he's so good at making use of his full tool belt so if you ever wanted to see a drummer that that elicits a a hyper emotional response which is difficult to do without other musical tools like um harmony melody chords you know Dave DeCenzo is just a go-to example for that sort of thing. So highly emotional, highly expressive playing, and not to mention his technical ability is just off the chart. So Dave DeCenzo is absolutely on there. And sort of in that same category, at least in my own mind, would be Yos Nickel. Yos Nickel is, um, to be honest, he taught Benny Greb, right? So you see a lot of crossover between those two. For me, I see that in their triplet vocabularies. There's a lot, of, a lot of similarities in how they express triplets. But with Yost, it's definitely, it's definitely that taste sort of thing. It's very emotional playing, but it's also, he just plays the right thing all the time, right? Like, you know, just imagine you're, you're hearing any song in any genre and we're approaching where you can hear a fill would be. There would be a fill here. And you could imagine that they could do this kind of fill or that kind of fill. They could go in this subdivision or that subdivision. And whatever Yoast picked, I always, when, when the one slams back down, it's sort of like, that was the perfect thing to play. Like, ah, oh, I should have thought of that. Like, I should have known that that's what was supposed to go there. So it's it's predictable in the best way possible. And by that, I mean it, it's like satisfactory. It is what you would have wanted to go there, uh, even if you didn't know it. Once you hear it, it's like, yes, that was the exact part that should have been there. So, Stephen, hopefully that helps answer your question. That's a little bit of an explanation on why I like those four particular drummers. I could probably find three or four more drummers that I could toss into this category of like my, my personal favorites. But yeah, man, hopefully that helps answer your question. Thanks for watching this clip. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want more content like this, I've got a ton of it waiting for you at the link in the description. Head over to orlandodrummer.com. It's an online drum school, very much in the style of Netflix. I've got 160 hours of drum content waiting for you there. Everything from in-depth masterclasses, interviews with pro drummers, extensive lesson packs, beginner all the way through pro. Check it out. I'm sure you'll find something you like, and I'll see you guys there.